this webinar um, so um, and we'll give you later the possibility to uh, watch that um, recorded webinar as well. So um, yeah, I would say let's start. My name is Christian Seiner and uh, I am happy to lead you today through, uh, through these slides, um, through our presentation. Um, that is a picture of me so that you know who is talking here. Um, I have with me um, today also my colleague Leah who is looking after the questions um, that um, I would ask you to um, put into the, the question field in here. Um, and we would um, answer them at the end of the of the presentation um, by order of, of importance probably. All right, um, I hope you are all fine and um, yeah let's let's start. So um, when it comes to impurity reference standards, um, in contrast to reference standards from the uh, for the um, active pharmaceutical ingredients for the APIs, um, for the impurity reference standards, there is not too much guidance uh, from the authorities. For the pharmaceutical industry, uh, for the, the APIs, um, you have a very good um, information in the, in the chapter 5.12 from the European Pharmacopeia, what you should do there for a reference standard, uh, for, for a primary reference standard for an API. But for impurity reference standards, there is not so much guidance there from the authorities. Um, when we have a look, for example, into the uh, major guidelines from, from the ICH, the International Conference on Harmonization, the um, two important guidelines are there, the Q3A and the Q3B guideline. Um, then you find there um, the um, quotation that reference standards used in the analytical procedures should be evaluated and characterized according to their intended uses for impurities or in Q3B uh, for the degradation products, um, for example. But that's all that is written there and uh, there is no further guidance on, on that um, from, from there. We had here, I am based in Germany, um, as is also our production site for the impurity reference standards, which I will introduce you later to. Um, we are also had here in Germany um, a document from, from the German Health Authority, Regulation Authority, um, that was from 1996 and translated there it was saying that impurity standards are used for purity tests and during method development and validation of such tests and that the identity should be ensured and purity and assay must be defined. Um, that document is nowadays outdated. It was uh, um, devalidated when our German regulation um, went to European regulation and that sentence is, is not in there anymore. Um, as well, but uh, based on this sentence we started in, in 1996 for example with setting up our impurity standards and providing them with the information that you will see later in this presentation as well. Um, what I do not have, what I've not mentioned here are uh, further local guidances. Um, there is for example from the Anvisa, there is a guidance, um, the RDC 53 and, and 58, um, where it is saying that uh, such materials should be characterized at least for identity with a mass spectrometry, um, with mass spectrometry data, with infrared data and with NMR data, a combination of two of those three for example. Um, but apart from that there is not much guidance really how, how you should, um, should characterize an impurity reference standard and so it is um, more or less up to you what you, um, what you want to do there, what you need to do there. And, um, but I will give you a few um, points here where you can think about and, and see um, what, what could be at least um, uh, a minimum um, characterization there for, for impurities, for example. Um, the intended use really determines the analytical effort. And there are two major types of uses for um, impurity reference standards. The first one is the qualitative use. And what I mean with that and what is also meant uh, um, normally in the pharmaceutical community is for example a test on the system suitability to, to see the resolution between the API peak and a very adjacent uh, impurity peak for example or the resolution between two adjacent peaks for impurities um, there. Also peak identification is of course a qualitative use and, um, and also during analytical method validation when it comes to specificity, for example, um, to validate the, that um, parameter 
that is also normally um, of a qualitative use there. Right, um, we have also however the quantitative use of course and that is for example um, the limit test and um, also the quantification of, of impurities there. Um, that you normally do either with the reference standard directly at each test when it is the routine testing and quality control or you have developed a method there where you are um, using the help of relative response factors in order to, to quantify your, your impurities. And um, you see that I have written here um, poll and at this point I would like to ask you um, a question. Um, I have prepared two polls and I would like to, to show you the first poll now. Um, which is for APIs and FDFs, finished dosage forms that are not controlled by um, um, just a second, ah yeah, you are seeing the poll now, um, for APIs and finished dosage forms that are not controlled by a pharmacopeial monograph, how do you, um, how do you um, quantify your impurities? Do you use the help of a reference standard there or do you work with relative response factors when you when you do that? Please, please vote. That would be great if you can do that. Um, I can see here that already 30% have voted. We are now at 40%. That's great. 50% um, already, more than half have voted. And uh, so if we can have a value of, of 70 to 80%, that, that would be great. Um, very well. I think, yeah. We are now at 77% and I think there are no further votes anymore. Great, great stuff. Um, okay, thank you very much for um, this first um, poll. 80% um, have voted and 63 of you are using impurity reference standards and 38% um, 38, 38 approximately are using relative response factors. Um, thank you very much for um, for um, sharing that information with us, and let's let's carry on with uh, with the presentation. Um, yeah, let's carry on further with the presentation here. So, quantifying impurity with the help of the reference standard directly, or with the help of the relative response factors. Um, another um, quantitative use is, of course, also during analytical method validation. Um, when you check the parameter accuracy, that is also, of course, um, when you do recovery tests of, a, of an impurity that you have spiked into your, into your placebo material, for example, that is, of course, also um, a quantitative use there. And um, on the next slides, I would like to, to show you what you should do there in order for, for having um, a standard um, suitable for qualitative use and for quantitative use. So let's look first of all for on an impurity standard for, for qualitative use. Of course, you should secure there the identity. And a recommended combination of techniques um, I would like to share um, here with you as well. So you should have a look on your material with um, HNMR, for example. Um, infrared is also giving you very good information um, at times, especially when you are comparing um, one lot that you have used before and that you want to replace with another um, lot or with another supplier maybe even, then infrared is a very good technique in order to check if, uh, if the identity of both lots are the, are the same. Um, CHN analysis, also known as elemental analysis, not to uh, confuse with the elemental analysis on, uh, on metals as it is now um, also a hot topic in the pharmaceutical area. CHN analysis um, gives you very well, very good information about um, this, the form in which you have the material present, even either it is the free base or one of the salt forms, and CHN can give you very good information on that. We will see a few examples for that um, later in the presentation. Also mass spectrometry from the coupling um, with the liquid chromatography or the gas chromatography is, um, is a tool that you should always look at and of course you should always interpret the spectra um, with regard to the substance that you have in um, at hand. And you see here also um, that I wrote UV-VIS that you also, that information you also get from, from coupling with liquid chromatography and or, and or gas chromatography of course. And here you see also that the techniques uh, that the uh, Anvisa is mentioning, HNMR, um, infrared and mass spectrometry is also mentioned here. What we would also recommend to have at hand is um, 
a kind of purity estimation at least from um, from the liquid chromatography or the gas chromatography. Sometimes you can also do a purity estimation with HNMR and you should have a target between 85 to to 90 percent there for your for your purity. I'm not talking here about assay um, but about purity so um, and 85 um, to 90 percent should be the target in in some cases you can also work with with 80 percent of course um, but you should not go go lower than that because otherwise um, it comes to uh, will come to difficulties um, when it comes to the interpretation of the HNMR um, data the signals there and the infrared spectroscopy um, signals um, as well and you will have difficulties to to interpret those correctly when the material is is lower in its purity than than 80 percent for example okay so that is about uh, for for the qualitative use when you um, want to set up an impurity reference standard for quantitative use an accepted approach um, that we see working in practice very well because we um, characterize our materials like that and we know from our customers that they are um, used very often in dossiers and, and are always well accepted there. Um, um, that accepted approach I would like to, to show you now. So you need to um, determine of course identity and assay. Um, let's have a quick look on identity once again. Um, it is just as aforementioned um, the techniques that we have discussed um, before um, already. That is also what you should um, have available um, not necessarily everything on the certificate but at least in the back end you should have that information available there um, and that is what we what we do we have uh, interpretation data of NMR infrared the CHN mass spectrometry and the UV um, this of course as well um, more interesting is uh, to look on the on the essay <clears throat> and uh, there we prefer to work um, with the 100% method um, that is also known as mass balance approach and um, is described by the formula that you see displayed now here um, below for example. So um, what you do there is that for the assay you um, subtract water and residue solvents and any other um, um, contribution that is not the um, organic material itself um, from 100% and multiply then with um, with um, chromatographic purity. However, for an impurity standard, the normal approach is to to um, do this one here: water and residue solvents, um, sulfated ash um, experiments for the inorganic is normally done um, for APIs only. And you see that also um, reflected here in the in the presentation. Um, so water by Carl Fischer or the coulometry version of Carl Fischer residue solvents you can do that by HNMR estimation or you can also use a gas chromatography headspace approach if necessary for an impurity it's a little bit over designed to do that but for for APIs that could be a good um, good approach there um, to use GC headspace for example you subtract all absolute percentages so everything that you have as mass fractions or as weight percentages you subtract that from 100% as was shown already in the formula here and then you multiply that um, value with the analyte's relative percentage um, for the chromatographic purity. Liquid chromatography or, or gas chromatography is normally used for that. You can also use another um, technique but it should be sufficiently specific um, that other technique. Um, QNMR can be used very um, very well as well. We um, do that um, sometimes <coughs> for impurity standards now um, too um, but our normal approach is, is still to use the 100% matches. But QNMR is, is a very powerful technique and almost as specific as, um, as the 100% method. All right, so that was um, how you should characterize a qualitative reference standard for impurities and a quantitative reference standard for impurities. Um, now in the next slides I would like to show you our certificate of analysis that we set up for, for quantitative impurity reference standards and as I said these are regularly uh, um, accepted by, by the authorities. So um, of the material here it is the omeprazole sulfur and oxide molecular formula there, uh, structure formula here, molecular formula there, 
molecular weight, a cast number if it is um, available, and then some um, general data here as well, and the assay that we have um, set up with the 100% method. It's shown later once again in the in the certificate. We have then the identity section on the certificate, uh, starting with uh, um, the HNMR spectrum. You see it displayed there, and then you'll find always a sentence like this one here. The structure is confirmed for each identity um, technique. You find a sentence like, like that one here, that the structure is confirmed with the signals of the spectrum and the interpretation. And with that, we formally um, confirm the structure with the help of that, um, that technique. Next page is showing then um, the mass spectrum. Um, you see the formal um, confirmation of the structure down here once again and um, the last identity technique that is normally displayed on the certificate is the um, infrared spectroscopy again with uh, formally confirming here structural um, formula. <coughs> then starts the purity section on the certificate. We use their um, HPLC as much as possible rather than GC um, because um, most of the materials are of course not um, going through a GC column very easily. So HPLC is um, the approach that we normally use. We have, you have seen on the, on the slide before, you have seen the chromatographic conditions given. Here you see now the um, chromatogram itself with a percentage report and the average purity result here that will be later used in the 100% method formula calculation. And then on the, on the last page here, you see um, the results for water content given and for residue solvents. The final result is listed here and the assay is presented with which you can later then quantitatively calculate. Um, and it is calculated by the 100% uh, method, by the 100% formula that we have already um, discussed in, this, in the slides before. So that is what we, uh, what we normally um, um, give as a certificate for our impurity reference standards and we can also add further techniques on that but um, our, our experience is that this is um, suitable for the quantitative purposes our customers are, are having. Um, I would like to point you now to a few other things that you should consider during um, characterization of, um, of reference standards for impurities or when you look for, for uh, suitable suppliers for your, for your purposes. Um, and I would like to, to lose a few words about CHN analysis, which is um, at some times um, an underestimated tool. Um, because it is extremely helpful on, on issues that are concerning the, um, the question, do I have a free base um, in front of me or do I have um, a salt form um, here present with my, with my impurity? This is especially relevant um, to know when you want to use this standard for, for quantification. And we have seen this very often um, with our customers um, as a common issue when they switch from one reference standard, from one supplier to, um, to another, that, uh, that then um, they get completely different results because they switch from one form of the material, from the free base, let's say, to the salt form or, or vice versa. Um, we will also have an example there once again on the, on the next slides. Um, but, um, <clears throat> but here's also one, one example. Um, you see here the metachlopramid enoxide. Um, material. We had once a, a complaint from a customer about that, that his two batches did not match each other on the infrared spectroscopy and we could show um, the customer at that point um, that he was using the hydrochloride um, for a long time without knowing and using it quantitatively but without knowing and assuming he had the free base attend, um, whereas we were providing the free base really. And you could see that, you can see that very easily when you do CHN analysis. You see here the result for our material you see here the specified uh, value, the theoretical value, and you see that the um, values for C, for H, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen are matching very nicely the specified value and that we could be sure that we have not the hydrochloride at hand because these values, uh, the specified values for the hydrochloride did not match at all with our, um, with our findings here. So um, that was um, one um, specific thing um, 
we could show the customer there. Um, and we see that very, very often, as I said, when, when somebody is switching from one batch to, to another or from one, better say, from one supplier to, to another, um, then this is a common issue and um, it makes sense to be really sure that you have at the same time, again, the right material. Otherwise, you would see it in your results during quality control and might even perform a few OOS results that you need to, um, to investigate then. Um, we see that very, ho um, very often um, as an issue with salt forms during um, reference standards production. Um, we um, also um, have this problem sometimes when we want to set up a reference standard. For example, we, um, a few years ago we decided to set up an impurity for trazodone, um, chlorophenyl piperazine, and we wanted to set it up as a hydrochloride because that is a stable one. We looked there and, and um, the hydrochloride is also the, the solid form. We looked at literature data there and uh, saw that um, this material is described as a free base with a cast number like you see here and the molecular weight there, the hydrochloride with its, um, its values here and the melting point and also a dihydrochloride version is available for, for that one here. With, uh, with this data um, th then here. And we looked also in the chemical trade and looked where can we buy that material um, easily and then analyze it in our laboratories to the impurity reference standard. And we looked there on different suppliers. We looked on supplier one and he gave in, in, in his catalog um, the molecular mass of the free base, the cus number of the hydrochloride and the melting point also of the hydrochloride. But he supplied then when we checked this material with CHN analysis, with elemental analysis there, we saw that he was in fact supplying the dihydrochloride. Um, supplier 2 was doing more or less the same thing. He gave all the information from the hydrochloride, cast number, molecular weight and the melting pot, uh, point, but, um, but he also supplied the dihydrochloride there. Supplier number 3 was funny enough, was supplying um, molecular weight from the hydrochloride, the cast number from the dihydrochloride and also the melting point from the dihydrochloride but he in fact was supplying the hydrochloride. So um, we used in the end, we used that material, analyzed it, um, purified it even and uh, set it then up as an impurity reference standard for our purposes for our catalog there. Um, but you see there as a kind of, of point to take out there you should not go just to chemical trade and um, buy a fine chemical there and uh, take for granted that the reference standard is coming with it as well. It takes a little bit more to check um, to um, free you um, or to avoid um, surprises in the end, to free you from surprises or to, to avoid surprises there in the end. Um, that is one, um, one experience um, that we always make um, also with, with our customers when they come to us with, with problems for example. Um, few more words to CHN analysis. Um, we um, also um, here for this uh, material here, risperidone, the anoxide of the cis version here, um, we analyzed um, with um, CHN analysis and you can see that there is a, um, a problem. You can easily see that there is a problem when you find values like, like that here. For example, when, we've, when you find here the, the um, practical values like 58, 7 and 11.5 percent here um, and the theoretical value um, is differing so much um, from, from that what you, what you found. Um, you can still um, work with that but it should give you a heads up that there is a, a problem with that and here in this case um, um, the problem was not really the problem but, but what we found was that we had 6.5 uh, percent water in the material as well and as you know we determine the water every time and when you correct um, the CHN analysis with that values, when you um, correct that, then you find here um, the corrected value to be quite close to the theoretical value once again and that you can use then once again as a kind of identification um, that you, um, that you um, yeah, you can use it as an identification test once again together with all your other identification tests there. Another hint that you have the right material in front of you. Um, another thing that I would like to, um, to tell you is that you should look for plausibility between the different uh, uh, available results that you have. For example, um, HNMR and HPLC um, can, when you look on, on these results, they should match with, with each other. Um, and what I mean with that is um, one example um, here, 
um, the bezafibrate in PUETA um, from the European Pharmacopeia chlorobenzoic acid, we provide as an impurity reference standards with a purity of 99.3%. Um, that is coming from, um, from the HPLC um, test here. Um, and you see that small peak down here. And we could find, we could uh, find a plausibility for that one um, also in the, in the HNMR. Um, you see here the small peaks for an impurity that was formed from the impurity chlorobenzoic acid. Um, and we find corresponding results between HPLC and HNMR. So we can be sure that we are also measuring here the HPLC at the correct wavelength, for example which can be um, different to what a customer, for example, is doing or what, what somebody else is doing and find then here maybe other results um, when it comes to the, to the peak, um, peak height or peak area here. But in this case, we could find it very easily um, um, confirmed by the HNMR results. So that is also one thing that we always do. We look, when we set up our impurity reference standards, we look for plausibility between different available results there. Um, another case here is uh, um, for impurity D of nabumetone um, that we also provide as a reference standard um, and, um, and during the development of that standard we found in, in the HPLC we found a result like that one here that we have our um, <clears throat> desired material here but also a, a big impurity of that impurity at approximately six minutes retention time. Um, this is the nabumetone impurity D here, um, for example. Um, and uh, what we could not see in this case here, we could not see corresponding results in the in the HNMR. Um, don't be um, um, now it's popping up here the HNMR, so uh, don't be overwhelmed by that. Um, we could not see here um, a corresponding result to, to that regard. We saw the solvent peaks of, uh, of the um, deuterated DMSO, of course, which are here and then here. We saw the um, C lane marker that we um, have here, of course, and we could also see the peak of the residual solvent, um, dichloromethane, that was, that was in there. Um, but we could not see in, in this region here, we could not see any um, problems that were confirming um, the HPLC result, for example. So we looked into the matter further and in, in the end we found um, that um, the HNMR was set up directly after we had dissolved that material in the NMR solvent. Um, the HPLC um, chromatogram that you have seen before, however, was taken after approximately one hour of setting up the solution. And uh, what we found there was um, in the end that the impurity D of nabometone is light sensitive and that it forms um, a mixture of the trans and cis impurity D after 24 hours of approximately the same um, ratio um, there. So, um, and we put that information on the certificate then later. So there is um, a light sensitivity um, forming the um, cis product from the, from the trans um, um, isomer. <clears throat> So that is also something which helps in order to set up um, reference standards in, in the right way. And the more than 20 years that we have now in, um, in setting up such impurity reference standards um, really gives us a lot of experience and uh, a lot of confidence also in our materials, in our certificates of analysis. Right, so um, I have a few more um, points to consider and, and one thing that we are often asked from, from customers um, is um, can I use a qualitative impurity standard for, for quantitative applications. We often have customers that are coming with a certain certificate to us and saying look I have this material is it enough for, for quantitative application and um, sometimes they ask us uh, with, with a certificate that clearly qualifies only as a, as a qualitative material they, they, they ask us, can I use this for, for my quantitative applications? And the answer that we are normally giving them is that um, it depends on the angle from which you look on it. You can do that, but you should definitely think twice about that. And let me explain why we, why we say that um, to, to our customers all the time. It's not just that we want to sell our materials, of course. There's also some uh, scientific background behind that um, all the time. So 
let me ask you another question there, um, and this is the second poll that I would like to, to show you today. Um, when the purity, for example, is indicated on a certificate of analysis or on a leaflet for that material, when it is indicated as uh, more than 80% or, or similar, with what, what value should you calculate then at that, um, um, to that regard, at that point? And uh, this is the second poll, as I said, that I would like to, um, to, to show you. So, um, I have a question here for you now. Um, with what value you should um, you should calculate, um, and please can you vote once again? Um, do would you calculate with 80%? Would you calculate with 90%? Because it is in the middle between 80 and 100%. Should you calculate with 100%, or should you, or do you have no idea? And uh, please can you can you um, vote on that? That would be great um, to um, if you can do that. And I see that 36% have voted already. We are now at um, half percent that voted. And I can already tell you that the result is quite interesting. It is quite interesting. Um, and I probably will show you the result in a second. Um, I can also do that if I manage the panel here correctly. We have 77% voted now, 80% um, voted, and I think that's, that should be fine. That should be fine. I will close the poll and now I will share the poll with you. Um, it should it should work now. You see that 36% have voted that you should calculate with 80%, 11 have voted that you should calculate with 90, 16 that you should calculate with 100% and interestingly enough 36 even said they have no idea. That's a um, very nice um, result here and let's go further on. Let me hide the poll once again so that we should have um, the slide back um, and let's uh, um, dissolve the riddle or solve the riddle, not dissolve, I'm sorry, bad English. Um, so please do not calculate with that value, for example 80%. Um, the problem is there that the material is probably purer than that value and there is a risk of underestimation then later of the impurity. If you underestimate your reference standard with the purity, um, you should, uh, um, you can also underestimate um, then the presence of that impurity in your material later. If you really want to calculate <clears throat> um, with a value, then if at all you want to do that, then calculate, please calculate with 100%. At that point, you have the risk of an overestimation only. Um, and I will explain in the, on the next slide um, why I wrote only there. So um, that, is, um, that is what you should, should, normally, um, should normally do there. And let me explain you um, why, this is, um, why this is so. Um, the risk of overestimation of impurities is normally no regulatory issue. Because when you overestimate your reference standard, and later then also in turn overestimate the impurities in your products, the patients that are later receiving the medicines are never at risks that they get um, impurities or a product with impurities that is uh, where, where the impurities are really out of spec. So, so normally the regulatory, ish, uh, uh, the regulatory authorities um, accept that, however um, it is a big economic risk that you are um, going there and the economic risk is uh, when you value it with um, um, in terms of money is the, um, that um, economic risk is much much higher than investing in a really uh, well characterized reference standard at the at the beginning so that is normally what the regulatories are saying um, they say we have no issue with when you are overestimating your impurity um, but um, but you should keep in mind that there is really um, the, the economic risks there. And I have put up a few economic risks um, um, down here that you should consider for that. Um, there are a lot of outcomes possible that can generate hidden costs there. And as I said, these uh, um, hidden costs can be much, much higher, much, much higher than uh, investing in a, in a carefully characterized impurity reference standard in the, in the beginning. So there is the um, possibility of a false positive out of specification result and when I say positive I mean above the specific uh, um, limit there for the 
for the impurity and that would lead to unnecessary investigations. And you know probably as well that there's literature out in the market where they are saying that for an OOS result um, they are um, saying there are costs for $10,000 or euros per day in investigating these uh, these results and very often an OOS result lasts longer than to, to investigate it lasts longer than than just one one day. There's also the possibility that you have issues during the validation studies that you are coming up with false recoveries or with not enough recovery or too much recovery for example in this case and then you need to investigate in that as well and that is uh, also something delaying the validation study and later then also the time to market for your for your generic product um, for example or for your product overall <clears throat> and uh, one thing that is probably generating the the highest hidden costs or could generate the highest hidden costs is when you are in the development of your finished dosage form um, or in the development of your of your API but but normally of your finished dosage form and you have to consider the ICH guidelines Q3A and Q3B when you are overestimating the impurity at that point you are at a considerable risk to push yourself into unnecessary um, and expensive qualification studies because you push yourself over the the limit to qualify an impurity to show really that it is not toxic at that level that is what is meant with qualification um, according to ICH Q3A and Q3B there and the last resort into the qualification studies um, is um, animal toxicolic, uh, toxicology studies there so you <clears throat> you uh, can be lucky that you can qualify um, your material with uh, the help of the literature but very very often there is no data available for a certain impurity and then your resort would really be to perform animal tox studies and these can last when you look into ICH Q3A it's written there they can last two to three months and are normally very very expensive and of course you have that delayed for the time to market. So that was one uh, um, perspective one point that I really wanted to, to share with you here as well. Um, <clears throat> and the less analytical details you have on the, um, on the certificate available, the higher the economic risk um, will, will become. So, and uh, we have seen, it depends on the sources, but we have seen a lot of qualitative standards that are often lacking the correct identity with regard to, to salt forms. As I've said before, we see very often when customers switch from one supplier to the next that there are then issues with, with salt forms. Um, and also water and residue solvents are of course normally not checked with qualitative standard. But one salt form of course is also the hydrate and especially water when you have the hydrate as a salt form, especially water in hydrates, can make a considerable part of the substance on hand. And when you even have a combination of a lot of water in the material which was not checked and then also um, for example um, a different salt form than what you would have expected then these two issues combined can lead easily to an overestimation of 40% of your material or more. What I mean with that is that you would assume 100% assay because or you are calculating with 100% assay because the chromatographic value was quite close to that um, when in fact um, the material is just 70% um, um, with a real with a real essay as is essay of, of 70% and that can even happen when even when the chromatographic purity is shown on the certificate as quite high this can can easily happen um, there if you have a combination of the salt form and the water issue and the water issue you never know um, really um, because um, on a qualitative material it's not very often tested so that is uh, what I, I wanted to, to share with you here as well. Another question and then we are at the end of the presentation and I would like just to show you a few slides um, um, about our, our um, production of impurities is uh, do we need a second assay method on a certificate for a quantitative impurity standard? Um, like you, you see that um, for, for primary um, active pharmaceutical ingredient reference standard for, for example, or as it is described in the chapter 5.12 from the European Pharmacopeia. Um, we see these requests sometimes from clients and uh, mainly they are coming due to requests from authorities, but also it is mainly from, from people in authorities that do not really uh, um, 
estimate uh, the, the the value for of an impurity standard in in the in the right way and they they throw in one pot an impurity reference standard and an um, and drug substance reference standard an API reference standard um, my personal opinion um, here is and also um, what we what we do on the certificates is that it is not really necessary to have um, to have a second essay method um, in there um, with the 100% method or the QNMR that we use, the risk of underestimation of the assay of the impurity reference standard is extremely low and that is the real risk for patients to underestimate an impurity and that is uh, um, normally not, not happening really. Um, so there's a low risk for the patients um, if there is a risk at all. The overestimation at the same point is minimized because we look on water and we look on the residue solvent so an overestimation is also minimized and the risk of the economical um, side that I, that I have explained before that's also then uh, minimized and at that point. And what we always have in backend with our materials is uh, we have um, the CHN analysis and from there we um, can deduce on the carbon content and can do a carbon titration there and, and also have a kind of plausible um, value in order to support the one that we have from the 100% method. Um, so that is, that is what, what our opinion uh, there is. However, if a customer really wants to see a second assay method for our impurity reference standards, then we put that on the certificate of course as well. Our primary API reference standards, which are not uh, a topic today of this presentation but will be for further webinars definitely um, that already have a second essay method because that is uh, um, yeah common sense to to have that okay with that I am at the end of the presentation more or less but I would like to keep you with uh, the last few uh, slides here um, of course I'm happy to discuss further about the um, the second essay method please send me an email with your um, with your findings with your thoughts um, I would be happy to get into discussion with you but with that I am at the end and would like to close with a, with a few remarks about our company itself um, LGC standards is part of the overall LGC group and one important thing that I would like to share with you, um, should you not know it already, is that our science and innovation section at LGC, at our headquarters of LGC in Teddington nearby London in the UK, is acting as the National Metrology Institute for Chemical and Biochemical Measurements in the United Kingdom. And to that regard, for example, we are comparable to the NIST in the, in the United States, for example. We uh, manufacture pharmaceutical reference materials within LGC. That is not the only thing that we manufacture, but for this uh, webinar I would like to point out only that. Um, we produce that in our site in Luckenwalde in Germany, nearby Berlin. And um, what we do there is that we have uh, set up manufactured reference standards for impurities, for active pharmaceutical ingredients and excipients, and we have in our range approximately 4,300 reference standards, reference materials there. We have constantly new developments like the primary standards um, that we have launched a few years ago and that we will um, um, shape, set up in a new shape this year um, as well. Um, we also have um, a brochure of almost 500 impurity standards um, that we have available with reference to the USP description. Um, in most cases we are less expensive there on these materials and we have a lot of customers that are, that are considering these materials, our materials, for their non-pharmacopeal um, work there um, because for that the C of A that we have, that we deliver and which you have seen before um, is, a, is a plus compared to, uh, to the materials from pharmacopeias which should be normally just used for the pharmacopeial method of course as you will probably know. We are ISO 34 and ISO 1725 accredited um, there and um, we also have customized services available at our site in Luckenwalde and I will uh, lose a few words about that in the, in the next slides as well. Um, not in Luckenwalde but um, within LGC we also produce solvents. We have those materials uh, for HPLC applications in the pharma industry but extremely pure and known for this we are for our solvents that are used uh, in the residue analysis in uh, food and environmental um, um, work there. 
We distribute, you know that uh, we act as a one-stop shop for all our customers in quality control that want also also want to, to, um, to buy their pharmacopoeia reference standards from us. We also have a range of phytochemicals available and for all other areas um, in all other analytical uh, for all other analytical purposes we have certified reference materials and reference materials available from LGC from ourselves as a National Metrology Institute but also from all the other metrology institutes that are um, relevant uh, globally. Um, a few words to the to the customized services that we have available you see here the service modules um, that we can offer. Um, these are modules that you go through, steps that you are go through when you set up a reference standard. We go through that for our catalog products as well. But what we can also offer to our customers is whenever they have problems in one of these, when there's a bottleneck in, in one of these modules, for example, we can offer um, that service to you um, as a customized one apart from the, from the um, catalog products. We have um, services um, that we do for two um, well, top 10 companies from the United States, for example, um, the first one you see here, they are doing um, a sourcing of their materials and a first quality control and identity check on their own for their materials, but apart from that, they give it to us and we provide then um, authentic substances for them that we certify, that we characterize first, that we certify and that we uh, package whenever an order comes in, we package that customized um, and distribute it. And uh, in between, we store their materials. We control them at our at our warehouses with temperature and humidity control. Um, the other company is uh, only using us for the logistic services, but nonetheless, we are their uh, um, relevant and, and important partner for for them as well. We also have services over the whole chain. Um, you see it here plus stability monitoring, plus, plus a QC batch monitoring, also batch to batch monitoring and we do that for several top generic and ethical companies and depending on the extent of the service, how long the contract is running, how many units you want to have there and how often we should send to you these materials from our side to you so that you can use it right on time, um, depending on the extent of the service, um, the price per unit can go down um, to, to even less than 30 euros there and we have a lot of companies that are even saying for this price it doesn't make sense that I set up my secondary standards anymore so we provide there to that customer's primary working standards for example and we will have further webinars where we explain that concept to you once again as well. With that I am more or less at the end of the presentation I would just like to um, tell you about our seminar that we have in April, that we um, will host in April in Potsdam. Um, days, uh, April days 6 to 7, we will be in Potsdam. Potsdam is close to Berlin and if you don't know it, Potsdam is also the city where the Bridge of Spies is located that has featured in the, in the movie from Steven Spielberg two years ago, for example. That is not the reason why we go to Potsdam, of course. We go to Potsdam because it is uh, very close to our production site in, in Luckenwalde and we will go there for the second day, we will go there and visit um, our production facility. But the main topics of the seminar at day one will be that we look on different kind of reference standards and their intended application areas and we will also see um, contributions there that shows how to handle the details that are presented on a certificate of analysis and that can help you to choose the right reference standard for your specific purpose. And we have also other um, experts presenting there. We have the EDQM um, there and we have um, um, a customer from Teva who is talking about um, their issues in uh, quality control and in development of, of impurity methods, for example. We have the contract laboratory LPU um, presenting there as well and then us, of course, uh, um, too. That is on, on day one. Um, we will be there in a hotel in Potsdam and uh, would, would like very much to welcome you there as well. Um, you will get the in information on, uh, on the seminar also with our follow-up follow email um, tomorrow then. Um, as I said, on day two, we will visit our production site in Luckenwalde and we will have there, uh, that is uh, Luckenwalde once again, our site there and uh, what we will uh, look at there is um, the, how we manufacture our impurity and primary reference standards so we will have a look 
and to the laboratories there and into our our um, analytical uh, capabilities that we um, have um, at hand there in in our laboratories and um, we will also have a look on our new warehouse and dispensing facilities that went live in in autumn um, last year and yeah as I said you will receive further information with tomorrow's follow-up email once again now I'm at the end of my presentation I would like to thank you um, most of the slides that you have seen here were originally shown at the um, International Reference Standards Symposium that was held at the USP's headquarter in, uh, in last year in November. So I think there the organization team of the IRSS uh, for um, the possibility to speak there um, last year as our representative. I would like to thank my colleagues uh, Dr. Sieg and Dr. Weber for the analytical slides today. And uh, yeah, please join us to meet them there and to see how um, we produce our reference standards. Uh, please join us there for the seminar in April. Um, <clears throat> and then I would like to, of course, to thank you as the audience today. And I would uh, like very much to, um, um, if you could take the short survey after leaving um, the webinar today. So and with that, I am finishing. And um, I say thank you once again. And um, let's see if we have uh, questions today. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello, good afternoon and good morning. Um, yes, Christian, we do have questions. So you have uh, answered the first one, so we're going to send these slides um, for those who have registered to this webinar. So the first question is, um, once purity and or identity is established, how is the expiration date established for the impurity reference standard? Um, yes, um, thank you for, for that question. Um, we um, have in place, um, parallel to um, when, when we have set up the, let's say it like that, when we have set up the reference standard um, and we have no data at all for these materials, we give an, um, an initial um, validity for one year for that material and in parallel we, we look at the, um, at the stability of that materials in, in very close intervals and um, with later we, um, we um, also um, extend then that, that interval period so um, in the beginning it is uh, um, six months then one year then two years three years and we we look um, on that and based on that we um, give them the expiration date, we set up the expiration date. Um, it is difficult to explain um, at the, um, just, just here but um, we, can, um, we can discuss that uh, question once again in more detail also in, uh, in, in another webinar but what we can say is in parallel we have uh, um, a detailed quality control program checking on the stability and uh, we then subsequently um, extend the expiration date for, for our materials. We distinguish, however, between um, um, the internal expiration date and the expiration date that we give on the certificate that you know, for example, when you are a customer of ours, we give an expiration date of one year or two years from the date of shipment uh, for the certificate there um, in order to, to be sure um, we, we have the right essay value um, on, on the material, but but in parallel we always check uh, the materials um, that they are still good for being sold. Good. And um, so next one, it's uh, may I use material quality reagent to use like internal standard or or resolution standard? Um, so I guess the question is if can I use reagent materials as an internal standard or resolution standard? Um, <clears throat> yeah, it is um, um, that that, uh, that use is, is a qualitative use um, and as a, as a resolution standard when you just want to see um, when you just want to see um, how how far are the peaks, how good are the peaks resolved from, from each other um, then such a, a quality reagent could be okay um, it depends on the um, it depends on the real use there, but but very very often in in this case the, that quality use qualitative use um, can be done with a with a quality reagent as well. 
Um, for an internal standard, when you use it as a quantitative standard there internally, um, that you that you compare then the <clears throat> the peak areas to the internal standard, um, that is a little bit uh, um, uh, different. Um, I would try to um, I would try really to to check that in that you uh, um, do that during the validation studies then. Um, if you have the um, the right recovery rates there, and, and then you would have uh, kind of validated that that use for this material as well. But um, normally um, it it does not work. You would normally get results that you wouldn't expect during such a um, such a um, such a validation study. Then there, yeah. Okay. So in the last question, it's a quite very good one. It's. Uh, why there is no uncertainty values for assays of standards? Um, yeah, um, the um, I assume that you um, that you mean there. Um, well, of course, we also the, the 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 person who asked the question is meaning there um, why it is not with uh, with the pharmacopeia standards, for example. Um, the pharmacopeias explain it um, with um, with the reason. Um, um, that for the use with the monographs, you don't need that uncertainty values, and uh, for um, for impurity standards, as you, you, you could see it on the certificate of um, um, analysis for our materials, um, for impurity standards, that is um, that is a thing. Uncertainty values for the impurity standards is a thing that is uh, so far not yet um, asked for by the regulatory authorities um, there, and we also do not give. Um, that values then on the on the certificates. It takes some time and, and some effort to um, <clears throat> to give uncertainty values in the certificate. So we don't do that um, at this point for for impurity reference standards. However, for our primary reference standards for the um, active pharmaceutical ingredients, for example, you see that values given there. We have uncertainty values there because these materials are produced under ISO 34, and uh, for that we have uncertainty values given. I guess when we have um, finished with the questions, but uh, if you have any other questions, you can email Christian Zainer directly. Yes, very well. Thank you, Leah, for uh, having a look on the questions. And once again, thank you um, to the audience. Um, and please take the survey, um, if I may ask you, um, when you are exiting. So I hope you find it OK. And um, yeah, I would like to welcome you for our next webinars. Thank you very much and have a good day or a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye.